Welcome back to the Shifting Schools podcast. I'm so excited to continue with our mini series here on esports. And what uh, belo- what started as a mini series of four to five episodes has gotten larger and larger thanks to people like Dr. Harvey, who, when we reached out and say, "Hey, would you like to come on and talk about esports in your classroom and in your school?" Uh, everybody has stepped up and said, absolutely, let's have a conversation. So Dr. Harvey, thank you uh, for being here on the podcast today. I want to get our conversation started with, uh, over on your blog, you share the step-by-step process you use for taking a game, Final Fantasy VII, and using it as a text in your eighth grade class. Maybe talk about your students' reactions and and how did you set this up and your students' reaction to actually reading a game as part of their their eighth grade uh, class. Hey, first off, thanks for having me on here. This is a great opportunity. Um, you know, since we're talking about gaming today and you know, there's going to be a lot of, what, what do you mean you use that or how do you use that? I think the first thing is to keep an open mind, you know, about how we bring games into the classroom and what does that mean for literacy and large and education. But um, it's really centered around what students are looking for. It's 2023. Mm-hmm. Kids are looking for new ways to learn language arts. And, you know, if Shakespeare was around today, he'd probably be using video games and VR and (laughs) augmented reality to display some of these great ideas. And so um, with that being said, you know, Final Fantasy or any of these great AAA title games are right up there with the best books being created. And so, yeah, I tried to bring back some timeless universal themes by bringing in games, you know, and I, I understand I and Dick Pentameter and Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet are great, but there are other ways to get across these literacy concepts to kids who, you know, to be honest, are not looking to be measuring the meter and rhyme scheme of, you know, your average five act play, especially when <laughs> they're, you know, interested in TikTok filters and in, in the new age of what's happening. Now, Again, if Shakespeare was around today, he'd probably be using TikTok. Um, but that's for another discussion for another, you know, guest. We're talking about games today and, you know, bringing in the popular games of the now is what's going to get kids to build a relationship with reading and learning and listening and speaking and writing. And so um, back when I was working in my graduate degree, you know, we're always trying to figure out how to get kids to read. And I thought, well, yeah. how do we... How do we build a relationship with with narratives? And they, oh, we got to get kids to enjoy the experience. And what better experience than having the agency of playing the story? And so that's where gaming came in. I thought, well, there's mm-hmm. plenty of games that have the narrative pieces in it that we actually get to control. And you know, for every game I've ever brought into the classroom, like kids gone, they want to adjust their avatar, they want to customize that character. And I don't think in any book that I ever read. The first four pages were, do you want the player to have a mustache? Do you want to change their (laughs) hair? You know, and no matter what game we've ever played, you know, even Fortnite, kids like, I want to customize my character first. And, you know, half the time, like, we don't have time for this. But I (laughs) realized even in a normal, traditional static text, there is not any time. There's no place for it. And so Mm. bringing in games was really a culturally responsive approach to building a relationship with reading and literacy for my kids. Because when I do bring in traditional literature later in the year or whatever, they go, oh, this is just like such and such in the game we played. I go, yeah, character development sheets, archetypes, plots, all those things. So I think like for any good language arts teacher, you might say, well, why are we reading this book? Why are we playing Mm. this game? Why are we watching this movie and it's not just because the actors are good or the cgi is great or oh it's such a great author it's because the content of the novel or that movie or in that game is relative to the curriculum that we're learning about so in final fantasy 7 we're talking about sustainability we're talking about politics we're talking about the hero's journey and Mm through that experience, I get to teach a lot of the things that might last five weeks in a traditional um, novel unit. 
I love that. And you know, one of the things that we keep touching on throughout this mini series is really what we're doing here is inviting student culture into our classrooms. And can you talk about what is what is that like? Are you seeing are are all kids into it, or is this much like I don't know uh, uh, anything else we do where you have about a third of the kids that this literally hits them? A third of the kids are like, yeah, I'll do it because the teacher told me to do it, and the third of kids, it doesn't matter. This isn't their thing. They'd rather be doing something else. Or are you finding that when we invite something that is this, I would almost say ingrained in a generation around playing games, whether it's that exact game. I mean, these kids have been playing games on phones or on consoles their entire life. Are you seeing more engagement from your kids around or when you, when you bring in the, these kind of um, esports games or these games into your, into your ELA classroom? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that it's a little easier of a sell to include mm. something with its popularity. I would argue yeah. it's harder to fight your kids to introduce a novel a traditional novel, you come in, you go, hey, what are these books doing on the table? And they're like, oh, wait, whoa, 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 are we going to be? And I'm like, yeah, we're reading this book for the next five. <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, man. Now, most kids can read pretty decent or – and I would say that the the level of literacy when it comes to gaming varies. We all might be familiar with games. Sure. Um, but I try and choose games that are – easy to play, um, but you get a lot mm -hmm. out of it. And I think a lot of us have to figure that out with books too. So I do think it's a, it's a selling point, right? Like uh, how much do we have to fight to get our kids to learn? Um, how hard is it to make our kids enjoy our vegetables? Right. And so I try and think games are the, are the sneaky way of getting the vegetables in. Now, traditionally, I think right. it's very difficult to try and sell a kid. And I'm not saying it's hard to sell kids on books. I'm just saying like when you're comparing it to games, the buy-in is right. much higher, right? And I, you right. know, that was my traditional background was I went to college, you took classes on, um, you know, books for young adults. And we, we took classes where it was supposed to teach us grammar. And, you know, right. I, I now wonder when you're going to the College of Education, why you don't take a coding for educators class, why you don't have a video games for young adult literature class. Like there are things we're kind of missing that yeah. are supposed to be preparing us for the generation of the now. Um, you know, the average age of a teacher in this country is 42. The average age of mm. a gamer is 35. So we're reaching this intersection point where you would say, oh, yeah, like everybody knows how to game. Everybody understands some of those basics. And we're not talking about Tetris anymore, which, by the right. way, a great movie is going to be coming out about that soon. But <laughs> we're definitely trying to figure out how do we get our kids to build a relationship with literacy. And yes, I, I think it's hard to sell kids on anything, but that's what a good educator does. They are able to um, zest up something and deconstruct it in a way that students find a lot of um, worth to. And I think sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we get to that point in a book and you, you get everybody reading, it's whole group reading, everyone has their book. And it's week two or three, and they're like, they're actually reading, and they're into it. And you're like, <laughs> yes, like, see, if you just gave it a little bit of time and a good, yeah, that's right, yeah, good teacher's like, yeah, I yeah. got you, I got you, I know, <laughs> I knew you'd like this. And for a game, you know, I really don't have to try that hard. I think I've taught, I think I've taught about thirteen video games as novels. And okay. treated it like this whole unit with all these things, essays, research, whatever. Um, and it's less of a fight. And that's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. It's yeah. Less of a fight. I, I don't ever, you know, there are struggles. Um, I always tell my kids if I wanted to, you know, pull teeth, I would have been a dentist. Um, so I, I think sometimes you turn on the game, just like sometimes it's easy to play a movie. And, you know, a film yeah. is literature class is great. You know, the teacher goes, let's pause it real quick. And it was like, no, no, no. And I'm like, I know this is just like the end of a chapter in a book. We're going to stop right here. And let's let's talk about a few things because mm. I never met any author of a book who went. And for chapter seven, here are the questions I wrote to ask your class. Like, they no, they wrote yeah. the book and it's the teacher's job to come up with these questions, these assignments. See, no one ever made a video game and said, now that you're done with 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 level seven, ask your class the following things. And you know what? Steven mm. Spielberg didn't go, and here are my questions that go with this movie. It's so it's like <laughs> we have to find as a teacher, you know, like where these, wh where our part comes into it. And I think for games, it's a, 
I think it's tricky for teachers. They go, well, I wasn't trained yeah. on, on to, on to call a timeout here. And, and I argue though, right away, just saying, yes, you were, this is a literary medium, just like anything else. And you are already trained to do and make and design things that go with this. Like you're a chef, you've used ingredients before. Yeah. You, you know, if you don't know how to cut an onion, you'll, you'll be all right here. Like, so here's some tips. I love that. And just to remind everyone that we will put a link to the step-by-step -step process uh, that Dr. Harvey used uh, with fi uh, Final Fantasy VII uh, over there on his blog. You know, you have a ton of stuff, a ton of resources, and thank you for sharing all of those. Uh, and you have a portfolio of over a dozen pieces of research looking into esports and gaming. And we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes as well. But what does being a scholar gamer mean to you? And why do you think we need even more scholar gamers doing research in the future? What's that mean? I, you know, kind of segueing from the traditional game-based education literature, battle of the books. You know, we, we went from like, hey, our, all our kids should read, love literature, to the point where, oh, we should have competitions. Like, we should have battle of the books. Mm. Now we should compete. Like the kids that love reading, we should give them a place for them to like have a platform to compete. And I thought, well, yeah, here's our scholar gamer piece. We have kids that are good at gaming and now need to do something with it beyond their traditional ability to just do it. Um, right. And I think that's tricky. I think a lot of I th I think a lot of educators want to know what's next for that kiddo that's really good at something. And so there's a lot of skills embedded naturally into gaming and you know the the trendy word is to call them scholar gamers people who are doing more with the game than just having fun and you know right. just as much as you might say for the person who's an avid reader who what are we doing with it now it looks like you're you're reading a lot right but what are you what are you doing with it what are you doing with all this knowledge that you're you're getting i call it xp um you know like you're getting experience points in gaming uh, John Dewey right. would call it experiential learning, right? And I really think <laughs> they're the same thing. I think if John Dewey was around today, he'd be like, oh, the XP is in gaming, right? Just as much as yeah. the time reading a book is supposed to be equivocal to some type of thing or something we do with it summative, to summatively or formatively or like something. Like, what is mm. it? So the scholar gamer piece is saying, hey, let's honor the experience, the XP in this gaming, and let's make it mean something. What are they going to do with it? Is it STEM to STEAM? Mm. Are they creating stuff? Are they making content? They're not just consumers of the medium. They are now being content creators of the medium. They are using it to make stuff. They are not just watching and playing. They are now doing and designing. And I think that's a really fun agency based approach to what we call scholar gaming is that we're not just enjoying this like we're actually benefiting from it hmm. i like that and i like this idea that there you're building these skills what are you going to do with these skills you know in playing playing games or going through being a scholar gamer you you are building skills much like you said i love that analogy right when we read books we're we're gaining knowledge and you can have all the knowledge, but if you're not applying it in some way, if you're not taking that knowledge and doing something with it, I would you, could you even consider yourself a knowledgeable person? You know, I think that's such a great, I really like that. I think that's such a great, I just yeah, a great way to be thinking. We in the, back in the day, like let's say a hundred, hundreds of years ago, we would make fun of someone who go, all they do is just read. They don't, they don't go outside. Yeah, so they don't do anything. Like we would just as much as the, the stereotypical, like all you do is game, man. All you do is you just yeah. game. Like all you do is just watch games and play games. We would say, well, what are you doing with it? And so yeah. I think now we wouldn't say that about someone who reads books because maybe that are, you know, that, that isn't maybe as, as popular, but we would certainly still think the same as to someone who just goes into the room or goes to a park to read. We go, well, I want to know what you're thinking. What are you doing with it? And it would be very yeah. valuable, right? We go, wow, I'd love to actually ask you some questions and, and make some content. Yeah. And, and the same thing is happening for kiddos gaming, except I think it's marginalized. I think, and I'll, I'll say an unpopular opinion here, I think video games are the best babysitter for parents at times. They buy this thing and then it takes care of their kid at times. I, I argue right. there's not a lot of 
there's there's no back and forth. There's no hey, what'd you do in the game today, or how'd that go, or like, can you tell me about right. your Legend of Zelda experience today? Like, how did you build up your character, or who are the antagonists? I think a lot of times, like, well, here's the game you wanted. Go ahead, and it's not hey, you know, over dinner. Like, I saw you were playing in a new level, or what? What's that all about? And I think that's yeah. the same as if you sent your kid into the room or into a park, and you say, hey, what'd you read today? I think they would love yeah. to tell you. Um, so. Being a scholar gamer means being or or having somebody entertain the thought that you're doing something beyond entertaining yourself. And that means that mm. you're doing something. And so we got to ask those gamers, what are you doing? What are you making? What do you think? Because I, I think some of the stuff they're doing is quite honestly more sophisticated and challenging than what we see in traditional schools right now. Ooh. Talk about that a little bit, will you? What What do you mean by that? That you some of the stuff they're they're doing is more sophisticated than what we see happening in schools right now. Uh, you know, I think some of the like. Let me go back into time. You know, when I was in middle school, I had to remember and memorize a periodic table of elements, which at right. the time seemed ridiculous. I was like, how <laughs> how am I going to remember what beryllium is? Like, what, why? You know, and um, how am I supposed to know that? And, you know, the acronym for iron is SF or, you know, what, what does that mean? I remember the Santa Fe Railroad and I remember iron and I had to I had to use these like tricks. But I can remember like 250 different Pokemon and I can remember who it's a water, what's a fire, what's an earth. I know their weakness. I know their HP level. I know their special ability. <laughs> I am like, how did I learn this stuff? And I'm like, if I would have just learned the elements and i think <laughs> like games have this way of doing things to teach us without us not even realizing it and so mm. i don't know how many games have really tapped into this there's this you know argument between what's game-based learning and what's edutainment and there is a big difference right, right? one is like you don't realize there's onions in it and the other is like right. yeah, that's onions Ugh. um <laughs> no, sorry to the, to the listeners who like onions i happen to not and so i use that analogy a lot but the re the reality is um games can teach us these sophisticated things by just experience and you mm -hmm. know i happen to really like pokemon i don't even remember how to play the game with cards but i remember the culture of pokemon mm -hmm. and there's many other things like that that's just a card based game now when we're talking right. about Let's just say Skyrim, a very popular open world game. You know, there are thousands of stories that you can read in Skyrim that amount to hundreds of thousands of pages worth of just, oh, I'm going to go into this virtual world. Back then, we wouldn't call it the metaverse, but, you know, you could be in the world of Skyrim, go into a world, yeah. open up a book, read a book in a virtual world, and you'd catch your kid, you know, like, what are you doing in there? And you're like, I'm just reading. You're like, you're playing the game. You're like, no, 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 <laughs> I'm reading in the game. You're like, oh, this is pretty, okay, so... And there are, you know, classic stories. So that's just like a, a tangential thing there. But, you know, I go back to James G, he, you know, a popular guy in the field of game-based learning and literacy. And I remember him talking about this game that I never played, uh, Civilization, very popular game, mm -hmm. um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commands, you know, quite, quite complicated. And, you know it takes a little bit of effort to get it going. But once you do, you, you start to feel like you have the ability to, to get into it. And such is the same for anything. And I think you need a little bit of knowledge to get chemistry going, but it's hard sure. to initially develop that fundamental set of skills that make you go, all right, bring on more test tubes and chemicals. Now I'm ready. Triple bean, you right. know, balance pipettes, get the Bunsen burners. <laughs> let's go, you know, and without that language at first, it's hard to really, Get it going. So I say in games, which are like so complex in the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people making any one single game. Games make more than the movie industry. They make more than the book industry. And they take teams of people who might honestly make a Pearson or McGraw textbook look like child's play to make this one 70-hour mm. experience happen. So – you know, what happens to the person who plays it? I think a lot, you know, psychologically is changing in their brain as a result of them participating in that experience um, mm. willingly. You know, they're, they're going into this challenge being defeated, coming back into it, wanting to try again. 
Um, and I think about these games that have recently been uh, so difficult, but yet people, I go, how do you want to play whatever game, but that. then you don't want to go to math <laughs> the next day? Right. I'm like, I'm like, math seems a little bit easier than um, <laughs> playing on extra hard mode on the, you know, but that's, that's, there's this phenomena there. So mm. when I talk about the sophistication of games, it's not just the medium itself, but it's the user it's a UI. It's it's the it's the medium and the user, and they interact together so well. Sometimes it's like Velcro; they're just waiting to connect with each other, and they're hard to separate. Hmm. I like that. You know, it's very rare that uh, I get to talk to somebody who's an educator and also a gamer. Uh, you know, you uh, are a Rocket League national champion player. Congrats on that. Hey. Uh, and from the player's perspective, what are some of the benefits that you see? I, I mean, I love your passion around this. I can tell, I mean, you've done a lot of work and, and you know, work with your, your kiddos around this stuff. And, and you have this perspective that I don't think a lot of educators have, which is actually being a national champion player uh, and experiencing these games in much the same way that, that many of our students do today. So from your perspective, what are some of these, what are some of the benefits that you know of being a gamer yourself that you know have either helped you in your career, have helped others maybe that you've played with in uh, their own paths and careers that you're able then to take when you're doing this stuff with your kids in your classroom? Oh, that's a great question. You know, it started off with, hey, you know, we had a gaming club and the kids kept playing mm. games, you know, with each other. One kid's like, don't when do we like get to play like another school? And I was like, Oh, that's a really good point. Like, so four years ago, <laughs> I was like, I guess we could like go to the other 27 middle schools in Albuquerque and ask if there's anyone else like us. And lo and behold, Oh my gosh, it was like striking oil. Of course <laughs> there are other kids at other schools who would love to compete in a game against it. And like, it just blew up right there. And there, I was at the point where, you know, I was, I had, you know, some gaming literacy and I like gaming, but I wasn't a competitive gamer. And I always had the stereotype. Mm. I had to be playing Halo and be eating Cheetos and like be, I don't know. <laughs> it was like something, it was different. With your hoodie yeah. up and you just had to do the whole thing. Yeah. It was very, I was like, wait a second, wait a second. The scholar gamer approach here is that we could deconstruct this and make this an educational mm. experience. So I started with a very popular game, Rocket League, that was you know, E for everyone, very general based. It's, it's cars playing soccer and you control the car. And, um, it's very three dimensional physics based. It's like, uh, calculus with gaming uh, kids don't know, right? You're tricked into like, wow, right. like this quadratic plane is like 3d. And now it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so amazing to watch kids fall in love with something that it's completely relative to so many other fields. So like that's just another story in itself. But starting off coaching a team that I hadn't even like – I didn't even played the game myself. But a lot of kids had, right? And that's what we sure. have to start as teachers. Sometimes we have to honor the things our kids right. bring to us. So I started playing Rocket League four years ago. And I tell you, it was freaking hard. Uh, <laughs> and I think the kids really appreciated the fact that I wanted to play and not just honor what they were doing. Oh, well, you all go have a good time. And I, th I think it's OK. So you go do it. They're like, why don't you play? And I'm like, that's a good idea. You know, I, I don't. I, yeah, let me let me start playing. And, you know, at my school, there are three levels. There's a beginner league. There's a, oh, I think I'm getting it league. And then there's like, oh, mm. I'm good and I want to compete league. And so, you know, over the years, I slowly was getting to be better and better. And, you know, at this point, I've put about 1,500 hours into Rocket League. I think when the game wow. kind of calculated that, that's about 45 or so days worth of playing, like in a game, wow. like 45 days of in a match and, and over four years. So right. I'm thinking of some famous 10,000 hour rule, not Malcolm Gladwell right. who made it popular, but just like the whole idea of that was, you know, I'm far from actually becoming an expert, but in the league where other teachers and, and other educators are, are using this, I was able to compete myself and say, hey, I'm willing to put in the hours. You know, after I finished my PhD, I was like, all right, well, I got nothing to do. Let's grind <laughs> in the game. I was so happy to step away from writing hundreds of pages a year and, and start putting it into, you know, 
the game and my kids appreciated right. that you know when they're asking how to do something i didn't send them to page 75 of some manual or some youtube video i was working with them eventually and then showing them and that is such an mm. empowering skill or feeling is to acquire something your kids are doing and then to be able yeah. to then show them eventually because at first i got to like see it as a learner I was flopping around like a fish on land at first. <laughs> and it's such a good feeling to go back to that and go, I yeah. actually know what that was like versus like, mm. I'm just as clueless as you. You can actually, you know, show some growth. And back then it was cool because like your students could see that you were growing with them. Now they're like, man, you're good. Like, how do you do that? And there's no like, you don't understand. Like, I used to be horrible. Um, yeah. I put 45 days in. That's how I, that's how I'm able to yeah, do that. Go home and do 20 minutes of reading, please. Like yeah. a day, like yeah. I'll go home and play NBA 2K for an hour and a half. And then I ask him, Hey, did you do your math? And so-and-so's classical? No, like I can't believe they assign me math homework every day. And I go, your math teacher can't believe that you play NBA 2K for an hour and a half every day. <laughs> Doesn't that seem a little off here? Like, yeah. So there is some relativity there. I think becoming a national champion was partaking in something that I was also honoring for my students. And I happen to love I it. Love it's that. not like I was sure. doing something I didn't like, but I think that's where it starts. I didn't know that I'd like Rocket League and I had to try mm. it first. It wasn't like, man, I, you guys look like you're having so much fun. I wish I could. I totally had the ability to partake in it. It's just, yeah, did I? So. <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome what are some of the other skills you know i, I know you said your so maybe talk a little bit about your your school you said your school kind of has three separate i don't know you'd almost call them what'd you call them three separate clubs like beginners kind of getting good and then those ready to go out in competition yeah how does that or is this at a middle school or middle school high school combined what middle does this school look like? like me and a couple other coaches designed this conference the western regional middle school esports conference free conference for esports okay. california to new mexico and up and we thought you know we should give kids a skill-based place to play and there's another national league where you play and you might play against another team and they're just super good and they destroy you you know it just reminded right. me when i was a kid in fourth grade bless you miss agree but she would call I, I every time i went up on the math board and there was this math contest, <laughs> and I still remember the stupid line drawn on the chalkboard. And they, she'd call up another student who was always so goaded at math, like it was just so unfair. And I would get destroyed, and it made me not even <laughs> like math. Not even I was like super right. good, but like I was, this isn't even fun to try. And in esports, yeah. it's not fun to get your butt beat that bad. No, yeah, yeah, you don't want to like it. So. We designed a conference where it was skill-based. And so there are thresholds in Rocket League, for example. You play competitively and you get a rank, like bronze, silver, gold, so on and so forth. And so you naturally have this formative assessment embedded into the game that kids actually try their hardest to show how good they are, unlike the tests we mm -hmm. give our kids three times a year that are that they're not happy about. Kids can't wait right. to try their best to actually show in the game another phenomena, really how much learning and growth they've shown. And so You've done. Yeah. for sure, we tried to make this something where the beginners got to play the beginners. And it's really fun to watch beginners play beginners. And there's a lot of natural, I would say almost call it zeal. You know, you get to see this, this <laughs> special, this special level of competition where then you go to the highest level. These kids have no ceiling. They're, they're, the skill cap is unlimited, and they get to put it all out there. And I think it's really appropriate that in school, I know we don't always follow this model, but grades are one thing, but your ability is another. And if we put students mm -hmm. like with other students who at the same level of ability, I think we'd see a much different outcome. Now, mind you, in my program, let's say we have 15 kids, a few ladies, Majority uh, male, unfortunately, is not quite unique, but all grade level, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So on my varsity team, we have a sixth grader and a couple eighth graders. And at the mm. lowest level, we still see eighth graders and sixth graders and guys and girls, and they're all at the computer playing. And you know, they're like, "Wait, what? What? What team is this? Is this a, 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 a <laughs> wait? Is this?" is this the eighth grade? I'm like, we don't have eighth grade teams. Like, is this the, uh -huh. you know, I go, it's all ability. So you could be really, it's ability yeah. Level. And I, I really don't, 
I think it's intimidating and it really disrupts the current model of the way we do things. But that is, in my opinion, a very appropriate approach is to mm. let us let us go with the learner, right? And sometimes mm. they excel and I push them up. Um, I don't think too many people regress. Um, we might hold people back from going forward, but I don't, it's very rare that we go, we actually put you too far ahead. Let's, let's <laughs> take you back a grade. Like I've never seen that. We always just hold them yeah. at the level they're at. So if there's anything to get from this gaming esports thing, it's that, you know, we, we got to go at the pace of our learners, whether they're gamers mm. or readers. I love that. I love that. Well, as we get ready to wind this up, uh, if if educators wanted to get started and they're listening to this podcast and they're saying, you know, I'm an ELA teacher. I love this idea about, you know, bringing the story of games in to get kids interested in reading. Uh, of course, we're going to point them to your blog and all of your amazing resources that you've given away. Thank you for that. Uh, where else should they reach out to connect with you or other places that they can go to to get resources around some of these ideas? I, you know, it's, this is a very cliche thing, but I, I say ask your kiddos. I say, okay. you know, they're, they're very good. Good start. Yeah, they're good start. Um, you know, a lot of times you say, hey, you know, what games should we do in esports? They'll go, Call of Duty. And I go, well, hold on. We can't do that. That's a little too graphic, but it's a good place to yeah. start. Um, so I always say student first. But then, you know, I would go to some of the websites that are doing some great things. Games for Change, um, they have a great conference. They're always doing things about the positivity and empathy centered around games. Good places like NACEF. Um, it's a network of gamers and scholars that are helping people bring esports and gaming together in education. And, you know, I would say just a good research through Google and YouTube will find some gems. I, I you know that's how it started a decade ago for me when I did, you know, this stuff for my masters was like, where, where, where is the content? And I know people are already kind of doing this and it was fun to kind of find my own primary sources. I know everyone's always looking for them, but I also say yeah. with the handful of suggestions, go find some yourself and take ownership of that search instead of just taking what other people have to say for you. Yeah, I love that. And we uh, interviewed uh, uh, Gerald, uh, who's the CEO and founder of NASF. So that's also oh, he's in down the series, road so for me in Santa Fe. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so it's it's also on this mini series as well. So yeah, we've got some some great things going on here. Well, Dr. Harvey, thank you so much for joining us today. If people want to learn more about you, follow you, follow the work that you're doing with kids, where's the best place for them to to reach out and follow you? Well, I have a, a LinkedIn. You can find me at Miles Harvey. Uh, you can also look up uh, milesoflearning.com as a website, and then my YouTube channel, uh, Miles Harvey, also has probably 300 videos. Um, lots of cool stuff you can look at. So those are three great places to start finding free stuff. And if you ever want the academic, the juicy, the dense things, you can go to Miles Harvey on Google Scholar and look up any of my 13 publications and two books. Ooh, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you just got home uh, from work, so I, I will let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. But thank you so much for being part of uh, the Shifting Schools podcast and part of this mini series on games and continue to uh, in bringing student culture into our classrooms. And I think esports and gaming is such a great way to do that. So Dr. Harvey, thank you so much for spending time with us today. You got it. Game on, learn on. 